So our panel today is, uh, we have, uh, going from this side, we have Doug Allen, who is cameraman from uh, Frozen Planet. He's a multiple BAFTA winner, um, and he's shot some of the most memorable, se uh, memorable, memorable sequences from the, the series. Uh, we have Dan, Re Dan Rees, who is producer, director of the climate change and the human e episodes. And we have Elizabeth White, who is producer and director from the series. So I'll hand you over to them. Thank you. Thanks very much, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, as Tim says, uh, my name is Dan Reese. I was one of the producer directors on the series, on the last two shows mainly, but such was the nature of Frozen Planet that the whole production team worked across uh, the whole of the series. Uh, so um, I'll talk a little bit about some of my specific work later on, but uh, I want to start off by giving a bit of an overview, background behind uh, uh, how the series was made and came into being. Um, well, I thought we'd start off with, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the series, or for those of you who saw it and fancy seeing it a bit more of it again, um, here's a little bit of a clip uh, at the series trailer, just to uh, remind everybody what it was all about. <laughs> Next Wednesday at nine on BBC One. There you go. We, we like a nice sort of subtle held back trailer to get everything <laughs> off the ground. Sort of underscore music. Um, great. So um, uh, a lot of you probably know Frozen Planet was a successor to Planet Earth. Um, so the way it came into being was, was very much uh, after Planet Earth finished. The executive producer of that series, as the Father Gill. Uh, was looking around for how to follow, follow it up, and Vanessa Berlowitz, who'd been the producer of the Ice Worlds episode of, Pla of Planet Earth, suggested the poles. Uh, and if you think about it, you can see why. It's, it's uh, kind of an obvious choice. Um, the, the, for one thing, a huge amount of, this, of, the, of the Earth is covered by ice and is frozen. A third of each hemisphere is frozen during the wintertime. So it really is an absolutely vast wilderness, and most of it is, is completely unexplored and full of uh, incredibly dramatic landscapes that nobody's ever seen before. And we knew there was a huge amount of uh, variety, uh, a lot of colour, surprisingly, at the poles, perhaps, and a lot of uh, you know, amazing you know, photographer's dream kind of, kind of stuff out there that we knew we would only scratch the surface on, on planet Earth, if you like. Uh, and we also had you know, some really fairy tale, wonderful places that feel like a world sort of beyond, uh, beyond their imagination. Also a great cast of animal characters, of course. Uh, all the uh, incredibly charismatic animals of, of the poles. Up in the north, obviously, you've got polar bears, you've got wolves. In the south, you've got penguins and, and orcas, uh, just, just to name but a few. Um, and we knew that there weren't necessarily a huge number of species to film up there. We weren't going to be able to go out there and find new animals that hadn't been filmed before, that we did film a few like that. But um, what we did know was that uh, there was a lot of animal behaviour that we'd never even, uh, you know, hadn't, hadn't been able to do on, on previous series simply because the scale of them hadn't allowed us, allowed us to do that. So we knew there was a huge amount of potential, and uh, Liz and Doug are going to talk a little bit about, more about that um, later on. Uh, we also knew, of course, that the, the extreme conditions of the poles were, were going to enable us to, to really give some drama to, to the lives of these animals and really uh, create a, a sort of powerful narrative through the series, which again was something we wanted to, to, to build on after Planet Earth, uh, try and make something that uh, had a bit more of a kind of soap opera feel to it. Um, people of the poles were always a big part of the package as well. Uh, we knew, again, we were... We wanted to take advantage of some of the cinematic techniques we'd used on planet Earth and, and bring that to people 
uh, in the polar regions as well. So it was always uh, an episode in people was always part of the package. And uh, the other compelling reason to make it, of course, was that the poles are warming and changing so incredibly quickly uh, that we just thought it was the right time to do it before it changes beyond recognition. So Alistair and Vanessa uh, went to BBC One, Discovery Channel, and, and BBC Worldwide, uh, and secured the funding, uh, roughly a third from each source. Don't quote me on that, but it's more or less that. Uh, initially just for six programmes, and uh, the seventh programme on climate change got commissioned a little bit later on. I'll talk about that later. And from early 2007, the team started to come on board. Uh, first question, of course, is how do you go about shooting in the polls? And uh, obviously there's huge technical challenges to overcome. Uh, first question being, you know, make sure your cameras don't freeze in minus 40. Uh, so our first shoot was not to somewhere like that. Beautiful landscape up in, I think that's probably in... Arctic Canada, we could be in Svalbard. Um, it was to a, a large Tesco deep freeze in Avonmouth, just outside <laughs> Bristol, which we filled with uh, you know, all the potential cameras for the series, and we, we put them in there at minus 20, left them overnight, came back the next day and saw which ones turned on, and that immediately got rid of a, you know, <laughs> a large part of that potential selection. Um, so that was a big part of it. Those of you who are interested, um, you know, uh, would probably be interested to know that uh, we shot an awful lot of the series, most of it, on uh, the Tape Vary Cam, which was the camera that was also used for Planet Earth. So it was, you know, in, in modern terms, getting on a bit even by the time we started on Frozen. Um, the P2 Vary Cam, which is a lot of people use now, hadn't quite come out. And even when it did, we stuck with the Tape Vary Cam because we knew it could cope with these conditions. Uh, uh, we had an established workflow with it which, that we knew would, would work. And we knew from our work on planet Earth that uh, the settings we developed for the cameras there um, could, could cope with the, with the conditions in, in the poles. You know, you're never going to get greater dynamic range than a, a black penguin on, uh, in Antarctica on a bright sunny day. And yet, uh, I think the look of the series really bore up. So um, the old workhorse did pretty well, I think. Um, so we winterized all the equipment. And that was stage one. Then we had to winterize the people. Uh, on, the, on the project. This is uh, the team up in Svalbard. We all went up there in uh, February 2008, I think it was, the whole team. This was taken at midday. Um, we're all off on our skidoo training. Uh, obviously, it's an incredibly dangerous environment, lots of survival we had to do. In the Arctic, we had to learn how to use rifles uh, just in case uh, polar bears, uh, you know, in case we're attacked by polar bears, obviously, you don't, you don't set out to try and shoot them. But uh, those are all pictures of polar bears that we're trying to shoot up there <laughs> um, with varying degrees of success. Only one person nearly had their head blown off. Um, uh, this is not spearing this unfortunate researcher, Freddie, to death. Uh, this is these are avalanche probes. Again, you know, all very important stuff. Uh, we had to learn how to, you know, how to survive out in the, out in the wilds because we knew we were going to be stuck out there for long periods of time with nobody around to, to help us. <coughs> First aid, a big part of it, of course. Um, again, on many shoots, we were a long, long way from any help, so we had to be uh, ensured that we could, uh, uh, you know, save lives if we had to. Um, and dunker training for helicopters was one of the most terrifyingly unpleasant things I've ever had to do. Uh, there's a, that's the cab of a helicopter, uh, and it's being dropped into a very cold swimming pool uh, in the dark, and then it's turned upside down, and you have to try and push your way out of the window which I uh, failed to do on one occasion. Fortunately, we have divers in there uh, who, who get you out. But um, I don't recommend it unless you have to, to be honest. Um, so we were then ready to go. And just to give you a bit of a breakdown of the series in numbers, we uh, had four years total production, a year planning, two and a half years in the field, which overlapped with a year of post-production, uh, a record-breaking, according to this, 2,356 days in the field, uh, one and a half years at sea in terms of, sort of total person days, if you like. Uh, over six months on the frozen sea, on the sea ice. Uh, 134 hours beneath the ice. Uh, we also had transport, uh, some unusual transport requirements. 38 sled dogs, 12 reindeer, 28 helicopters, 22 boats, 10 quad bikes, 33 skidoos, 8 sets of snowshoes, countless sleds, I hate those things. Uh, uh, two icebreakers, one in the north and one in the south, and uh, one Royal Navy vessel. This is the HMS Endurance, now sadly 
uh, scrapped. Um, that was uh, the Royal Navy very, very kindly gave us the use of their helicopters to film around South Georgia and the Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, on this shot, they'd even adapted one of their gun ports for carrying our uh, aerial camera there. So, big logistical challenges, uh, but um, an amazing experience to make. And I'm going to hand over now to Liz, who's going to tell you, go into some more detail about um, how we, how we uh, manage some of the sequences. So as uh, Dan says, I was a director on this series, so working on specific sequences across a number of different shows. And um, part of my background is actually a lot of underwater filming. So a lot of the stories I did were actually working on and sometimes under the sea ice. So I just wanted to give you a little, uh, little chat about the joy of sea ice. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting. A lot of the stories we filmed involved actually working on the frozen ocean. I mean, filming things like narwhal, um, bowhead whales, belugas, and so on. Um, when you, when you look at a shot like that, you kind of imagine that that's the ground, and obviously it's not. That's actually frozen ocean, and it's a, an environment that's very, very changeable. It's potentially very, very dangerous to work in, um, especially in springtime when it all breaks up, and there are certain people among us who have actually floated away on the sea ice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, you know, it's, it's a place where you have to really, you have to plan, you have to be super, super safe. Um, this is a, a team up near Baffin Island who are filming the narwhal, and we were actually dropping them in on a helicopter. So taking a helicopter out of one of the local communities, flying over, looking for narwhal, dropping them in on the sea ice, and then putting... Um, this is a pole camera system that kind of films off the edge as the narwhal go by. Um, in Antarctica, we had similar things, um, filming um, emperor penguins. Again, frozen sea ice, planes having to go in on the much thicker sea ice in order to access some of these really remote colonies. Um, this is the joy of launching boats. This is filming bowhead whales up in the, again, the Canadian Arctic. You, um, we're working with teams of local Inuit hunters who know the environment much better than anybody else. They're the safest people to be out with because they've grown up in that environment. And uh, when you're out there, you have to trust your lives to them. Um, so this is the joy of towing a boat out to the edge of the ice in the morning, launching it out into the frozen ocean. This is Cameron Doug Anderson um, waiting for the bowhead whales to come by and literally sitting on the frozen ocean whilst, whilst looking out for whale blows. Of course, the other environment we really, really wanted to capture because it hadn't been seen uh, very much at all was the life underneath the ice. And, um, and I thought I'd open with a bit of a clip from Antarctica from McMurdo um, just to show you some of the sort of new, weird and wonderful things that, that had been seen very um, infrequently before. We actually did two big underwater, well, under ice um, shoots for the series. One up in the Arctic, um, which I was involved with, which was um, filming um, the creatures that uh, come out during the melt and the whole sort of melting process in the spring. And then also McMurdo Sound in, in Antarctica. So I thought I'd just show you some pictures from um, Arctic Russia. This, this was the office in the White Sea. Um, so you have a Russian dive hut, which is quite nicely heated by a little wooden fire. And um, the access to the, the environment you want to film is, is basically the hole cut in the ice um, next to it. The water under the ice is always about minus 1.6 degrees C. I mean, sea ice freezes at about uh, 1 point, minus 1.8. So you know it's going to be cold. Like, whatever happens, it's going to be cold. And we put a lot of time and thought um, beforehand into choosing exactly the right equipment we needed to use. Um, a lot of diving regulators... I don't know if how many of you are divers, but um, a lot of them are not rated for very, very cold water. They kind of freeze up and they free flow, and, and that's obviously not very good if you've got a, a ceiling of ice above you. Um, so we had to plan very carefully what kind of kit we use, and this is, um, this is what we ended up using, which are special um, ice-rated regulators made by Poseidon. You still get little chunks, little shards of ice hitting the back of your throat every now and then, which is a little bit unnerving. Um, and the other issue is that you lose all sensation in your face. Um, you, you're all dressed up, you've got layers of thermals on, you've got a thick dry suit, um, you put hot water in your gloves before you put them on so that you've got nice, tasty, warm hands. But the one part of you that's always exposed is this. And within the first few moments, your mouth goes through this kind of sensation of pain and then utter numbness. And I, I think, for me, the most frightening thing about diving under the ice is the idea of losing that regulator because you cannot feel your mouth and you would never, never be able to put it back in. Um, it's really attractive. Everyone comes out of the water at the end of the dive and you're all dribbling and you can't talk properly. <laughs> anyway, this, um, this is how the Russians go about keeping themselves warm. Um, this is what we were being served out on the ice in Russia, um, which is raw pig fat and garlic. 
um, which is apparently the best way to keep your mouth nice and numb. The only problem is you then have a 40-minute dive with the taste of raw pig fat and garlic in your mouth, which is anything but pleasant. <laughs> um, entering it, we had to be very careful. Um, the dive holes can actually freeze up while you're under the water, so there's always somebody on the surface, both supervising but also making sure that you've, you've always got access. In terms of um, filming underwater, for this series we wanted to do something a little bit different. We wanted it to not look like a kind of wobbly diver swimming around. It had to look very, very cinematic, and, and that's very much the way that blue chip wildlife is going, especially for underwater. So it involved um, the use of a lot of the land-based techniques, so tripods and, and tracks and things like that. Um, in this case, this is um, Doug Anderson with a with tripod attached to the sea ice. So actually attaching it by ratchet straps to the, to the ice so that he could make nice moves um, that, that looked cinematic and, and sort of had that really um, blue chip feel. The other thing a lot of people ask is, um, is whether we storyboard things. I think a lot of people imagine that you literally just, you say, oh, well, let's go and film such and such, and you send the cameraman out, and he just comes back with a story. But actually, all of, our, all of our scripts and all of our running orders are very carefully worked out before we go. Individual sequences are all planned. And then when we're in the field, again, we're, we're communicating using storyboards, especially in a scenario like this, where um, your cameraman's going off under the ice. You, always, you haven't got particularly good communications, and you have to know exactly what shots you're trying to achieve so that you can come home at the end with a sequence that the editor can cut together. Um, and there's another shot from Russia. Um, the other end of the world, working in um, McMurdo Sound, it was even more complicated in the sense of you have a lot thicker ice. So um, to, to work in McMurdo, the team worked with uh, the National Science Foundation, um, the Americans based at um, McMurdo Station, which involved literally coming out with a very, very large drill and drilling through metres of sea ice in order to actually access um, the, the water below. Some of the sites, this is Granite Harbour, actually involve the team being dropped in by helicopter. Um, so once you're out there, the helicopter lands, kit divers out onto the ice, and then literally it's access through um, a, a hole um, that's, that's pre-existing. So in this case, it's, it's a kind of natural crack that the team were able to get through. Um, Antarctica, I mean, underwater is just magnificent, and the team had about 130 hours there in order to, to document the... Um, the wildlife and the landscape. Um, again, tripods and seabeds um, making it look a very sort of cinematic sort of feel. But one of the stories I, I just wanted to touch on was a story that made the press a lot. Um, it was a story we didn't even know was, would be able to be filmed. I mean, we go down, we go out into the field with ideas of exactly what we want, and every now and then something pops up which you just weren't expecting, and. Um, the team and, and scientists down there had always seen these formations of things that were nicknamed brinicles, which are like ice stalactites that were coming down from the, um, from the sea ice above. And they just happened to be there on an occasion when um, one of these was forming. And they could see that this thing was getting longer and longer. And I think a Weddell seal swam through and actually knocked it. And they were like, oh, that's interesting. It might start forming again in the same place. So we know where this is going to happen. And... Uh, that night, they rushed back to the, uh, the base and started putting together camera kits to be able to actually capture this in time-lapse. Um, they knew it was going to take several hours to form, and so they, the, the only way to, to capture it uh, visually was through time-lapse gear. So a lot of building went together. Um, all done using digital um, SLR cameras, all wired to um, lights because it was quite dark underneath the ice, so every single shot obviously had to have a, a flash go off. Um, three still cameras were set up around the formation in order to capture it. And um, what they captured was, was one of the most otherworldly things I think I've ever seen. Um, so I just wanted to show you a little clip of the, the brinicle, also known as the, uh, the finger of death. For anybody interested in the, the sort of technical side behind that, so that was, that was three cameras set, I think shooting about one frame every 20 seconds, and they left, literally left them down there for about five or six hours came back at the end of the day, recovered the cameras, and, and that is what had happened in that, that time period. So it's about five hours compressed into you know, a few seconds, really, half, half a minute. The other place we wanted to use um, time-lapse and lapse time techniques was actually in um, portraying seasonal change in the polar regions. And obviously the, the big sort of um, driver through the series is, is this sense of seasonal change that happens in the polar regions more than anywhere else on Earth. So at the, the beginning of the series, we sort of... Um, set out to do um, macro shots of um, icicles forming and, 
and all those sort of little details that help really capture that sense of, of sort of autumn and frost forming. Um, but also the bigger picture of landscape um, changes. One of the pieces of kit we used for that um, was a, a motion control rig. And it had been used a lot on um, planet Earth before in order to um, film blossoms uh, coming out and change, colour change of trees. But it had never really been used in freezing cold conditions. So this is another example of a piece of kit that was designed for a purpose that was not the poles. Um, and the, um, the company very kindly looked into um, R&D to be able to actually make it robust enough to cope with, with winter conditions. Um, what it involved was for the cameraman, we, we chose specific places and accessible places that we could go back to season after season. And the, the kit is clever enough to, if you, if you put it in the right place and you line it up right, it effectively remembers the shot you do. And you can go back months later and do the same shot again. Um, and then at the end of the day, in the edit, you have the option of mixing between them and, and sort of compressing time between those seasons. Um, we use it for um, waterfalls. Um, this is the Mackenzie. Um, this is just before and just after its breakup. So within a course of about a week, it goes from being a completely frozen lump of ice to being um, a free-flowing waterfall. Um, and it was, it was tricks like you know, motion control and time lapse which allowed us to actually make that visual, things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. This is uh, Warwick standing there with the uh, winterized, winterized kit. So I just wanted to finish with a little kind of montage of some of those um, techniques. Again, lapse time and also um, macro time lapse to just help bring those seasonal transitions to life. I shall hand over to Doug to talk a bit about behaviour. Me. Cheers, Liz. Um, now, I'm, Frozen, Planet, uh, Frozen Planet took about four years or something to make, but the story that I was especially interested in filming was actually I had heard about it, um, let me think, uh, about 32 years earlier. I first went to the Antarctic in 1976, and when I went down there at the tail of my first winter into the summer, began to hear talk about this um, from an Argentinian base, about this strange behaviour of killer whales had come into this channel, which was choked with ice, and they'd been hunting seals in this channel. But nobody had pictures of it. And, and it, this all came second or third hand from, uh, an American, from the, the Argentinians on the base. But um, it was clear that something was going on. And so when we did uh, Life in the Freezer, way back in 1991, we were looking for killer whale behaviour. And um, we, we didn't see it. We saw a few killer whales and we found the remains of some. There obviously had obviously been a predation on whales, but we didn't film anything. And um, but we kept it in the back of our mind and we looked for it also when we did Blue Planet. And um, all the time there were more and more killer whales kind of appearing. When I started in 76, killer whales were really unusual in the Antarctic. But by the time we came round to the mid, you know, 2004, 2005, they were definitely being seen more. And a tour ship had seen this behaviour properly, this behaviour where the killer whales make this wave to wash seals off ice floes. But it was a very shaky bit of photography, a long way away, etc., etc. But when I got there, Life, which was the series preceding um, Frozen Planet, Life decided to, to make a real effort to try to film uh, this behaviour. And they dedicated about three weeks of boat time and they put me on a ship with them, um, with the producer. And the idea was, look, just see if you can go and follow some killer whales and see what they can do and maybe we'll see this behaviour. So the usual way that you fly down to the Antarctic or the, or the people that, um, that we used in life and we subsequently used in Frozen Planet, you fly down through Ascension to the Falkland Islands. And um, to those of you who don't know the Falkland Islands, that's not a great picture. But uh, the Falkland Islands is kind of more British than, than Britain. They take it very seriously. They're all very intent. And um, this is the boat. This is the ship that we use a lot. Now, it's actually commandeered by a Frenchman called uh, Jerome Ponce. And Jerome's probably the most experienced skipper in the Antarctic and in South Georgia. He's also the most cranky and eccentric skipper that I've ever sailed with in the Antarctic. But believe me, without someone of Jerome's complete faith, we wouldn't have got the sequence that we got because um, it involves going into ice that, that normally most people would shy well away from. Anyway, you jump on the fleece. Now, the fleece is quite... It's 65 feet long. 
Um, it's quite well appointed. That's the central lounge sort of area. Um, sleeping accommodation is a bit more basic. You basically, the crew, the film crew, end up in the forward, end up in the bow section. Um, and the, the crew rather sensibly sleep towards the stern because the bow, when it gets rough, it's, you're definitely, one moment there's about 3G pushing you down into the bunk and the next thing you're floating somewhere two feet above it while the ship moves and leaps around. It's got a little galley kitchen and we all um, cook when we can. This is me turning out some wonderful meal or something like that. Anyway, so um, this is where we're heading for. There's the Falklands which are at the top of the Red Arrow. And we're basically sailing down across the Drake Passage. So we're heading to what we call the Antarctic Peninsula. You can see there just what a remote continent Antarctica is. And incidentally, that shows the big differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic. Antarctica, at the south of the world, is very much a frozen continent surrounded by sea. Whereas if you went to the Arctic and looked down from that same perspective, you'd actually see that the Arctic is a frozen ocean surrounded by land. So we're going to sail from the Falklands down to the Antarctic Peninsula. And that does entail crossing the Drake Passage, which um, is the stormiest um, part of the sea in the world. But I would say that if any of you out here are thinking of going to Antarctica and you're put off because of the potential roughness of the Drake Passage, don't. Because having crossed the Drake Passage about 30 times or so, it's only about 1 in 10 that's really, really rough. So if you're only going down there once, the odds are in your favour <laughs> that you'll have a fairly smooth crossing. Um, but it can get very lumpy. But don't let that put you off. Go to the Antarctic. And when you go down there, this is the sort of things where you, know, you can get beautiful places. There's the fleece anchored about halfway down the peninsula, halfway through that chute for life. Now, when we were down there for life, we were down for three weeks, and we found lots of orcas, and we followed them, and we did put together a sequence when briefly they got close to a crab eater seal, and they kind of hassled it for a while in the water, but then they passed on. But we had two problems on that life shoot. One problem was that while we could follow the orcas, we were doing it in February, and in February, the sun just goes below the horizon enough for a couple of hours that it gets very gloomy. And in that gloom, we lost the orcas. We were following them by sight. And in that gloomy period, particularly if it was a little bit rough, we lost the orcas. But the other problem was on that shoot that we just didn't have much ice. It was one of these years when there wasn't a lot of ice down the peninsula. So although we could follow the orcas, we were kept, we lost them twice, three times in the gloom. And also there didn't seem to be enough ice around for them actually to be showing that washing behaviour that we were after. So when I came back from that shoot, Alistair, who was working on Frozen Planet, he said, do you think that we should try again for Frozen Planet? And I said, yes, we should try again. But what we should do is we should go down earlier. We should go down in January when the sun is higher, when we don't get that gloomy period. And also if we go down earlier, we might get better ice. Now we were seeing the occasional ice flow um, with, with seals on it. And what we were looking for when we went back down was to see a lot more of ice like that, tighter packed, but with, with seals and things on the top. So we went back down to the same sort of place. I haven't got a pointer, but that's the Antarctic Peninsula. And basically, if you come about halfway down the peninsula, on the right-hand side, see that big island that sits there? Well, we were tucked in round behind that island was where we were aiming to go. And when we went down in January for Frozen Planet, the sea ice was much more what we wanted. This is the sort of concentration of sea ice that you want to go looking around when you want to see that behaviour. And um, it takes quite a lot of bravery to take a ship into that because as the, as the wind picks up and swings around, etc., that ice can get squeezed and, pa and, and packed against one shore. And if you're not careful and experienced, you will get nipped up in the boat and you can find yourself in a lot of problem. But with Jerome's experience, we used to bash our way through ice like that. But we also went down with Frozen Planet compared to life. We went down much better equipped. We had two camera people. There's myself. These are our secret weapons. It was myself and Doug, Doug Anderson, the other cameraman. We were, we were filming. We had two stabilised camera systems. In the foreground, you've got um, a standard um, 
camera, but on top of what they call a Mako head, which has basically got two gyro stabilizers underneath. And one stabilizes the camera in one dimension, and the other one stabilizes it in the other dimension. So with the camera parked on top of that, you can film from a rocking boat and still keep your horizon fairly level. And then behind us, up on the bridge house, we had a Cineflex, which is normally mounted on a helicopter. We had that mounted effectively upside down on top of the wheelhouse. And that gave us a second stabilised filming position. So Doug would usually man the Mako, I would man the Cineflex, and we could cover the action from two different angles, so to speak, at the same time. And our third secret weapon was the two guys standing on top, who are two scientists, two of the best killer whale scientists in the world. And they really had an eye for finding killer whales, but then they had scientific tools for keeping tabs on the killer whales, which helped us a great deal. Now, for those of you who haven't seen inside a Cineflex, it's basically a lens with a chip at the back of it. No recorder, you take the cable out of the Cineflex, cable it to a recorder inside. And the secret of the Cineflex is extremely um, expensive and very well engineered gyro stabilizing systems, which keep the lens rock steady even when there's a lot of vibration going around. And uh, with a Cineflex, you can use an 800 mm lens at the far end of its zoom off a rocking boat or a vibrating helicopter and still get very good controls. And you take your picture back, in this case, inside the wheelhouse of the, uh, of the Golden Fleece, and you control your focus, your zoom, your tilt, and your um, pan all through this control box. The um, various knobs and the little joystick give you complete control over the camera. <coughs> complete, complete control if you're good. Um, me, mine was kind of, <laughs> I wasn't as experienced as some people, <coughs> pardon me, on the Cineflex, but we did get some stuff. Anyway, so a combination of me on the Cineflex and Doug on the Mako meant that we were really well equipped. So the big question was, would we find it? And I have to say that, you know, it was remarkable. There's the Mako again, just nice and close. You can see the two stabilised things in two dimensions. So we went down and um, we had some great times and we found killer whales. And we actually saw them do the behaviour quite quickly. But then the second tool that we brought into use was that John and, um, John and Bob, the two scientists, they had a satellite tagging programme, which they wanted to do. They had these very small... Um, especially out of focus satellite tags. <laughs> and they could, I don't know why I didn't get an in focus picture of this, but I just didn't. You have to believe me. They, these are little, you can see how small these tags are. Now, these tags could be fired from a crossbow into the base of the dorsal fin of the killer whale. And those tags could be programmed that if they worked ideally, they would give us a positional fix on where that orca was that was about half an hour old. In other words, they were they sent off a signal every half hour up to the satellite, back down to the receiving station on the ship. And while, it, while you couldn't pick up the signal every half hour, if you did get a good uplink, it told you where the killer whale was. And that was really immensely useful, really interesting scientifically. But, for example, there was up at the north of the bay there was a constricted area between the island and the mainland. And on a few occasions, the killer whales would find their way north, too far for us to follow. But by keeping an eye on them with the satellite transmitters, we could tell when they were coming back south, when they were going to come through this constriction. And we would take the fleece up, park it just south of the constriction, and pick up the whales as they came through. And um, that's the, um, the dart on the, end of the, on the end of the thing. And... The information would get downloaded into the computers that we had on board, onto the screens. And you can see there's, there's, at this point, we've got two killer whales, two separate tags out. We've got uh, one tag labelled purple, another one green. And they are showing us um, where those particular killer whales have been and where they are over the previous 24, 36 hours. And just to digress, interestingly, this was what I found really good about this was, was that this was real coordination and combination of efforts between the film crew and the scientists. They really helped us 
to find the orcas and to stay on top of them. Meanwhile, we were offering them a platform for their research, which they wouldn't have got the funds for any other way. And one of the really interesting results they got was that, was that in one season when they tagged whales, they found that a tagged whale spent a month in the Antarctic, then it swam all the way up to off the coast of Brazil. It spent a month off the coast of Brazil, and then it went straight back to the Antarctic again. And prior to that research, no one had any idea that these killer whales made such short-term but significantly long migrations. And the theory now is that the killer whales, in this part at least, some of them are capable of coming to the Antarctic, stuff yourself with them, food, and then swim to the tropics where you metabolize more slowly. And then when you're hungry again, you just swim straight back to the Antarctic. And no one knew that they did that, especially not over those distances. A 4,000 mile migration in three months, I mean, that's pretty impressive stuff. And uh, I think it's always really satisfying when series of when programs with their facilities mean that science gets pushed on further. And the other neat thing, again, just a wee bit of a side, they have these really neat lasers on John, and, and uh, you can identify individual killer whales from the marks on their fins. So when you meet a pod of killer whales, the first thing that they would do would be take lots of pictures of all the members of the pod, because with those pictures, you can identify that pod the following season. But they had a further refinement. They mounted these two lasers on top of the camera, and these two lasers, they'd set them up exactly parallel. They'd, they'd do it off one part of the ship onto another. And then when you take a picture of a killer whale like that, an ID picture, which is the, that's the ideal ID picture, so you can identify that killer whale again from those distinct notches which stay from year to year. But when you use the lasers, you put two dots on the, on the picture. So you know that those dots are exactly 20 centimeters apart on your camera. So you know that they're exactly 20 centimeters apart on your whale. So it means you can measure the width of that killer whale's dorsal fin. And you can do that on lots of them. There's another one with two green ones. Now, when you then take a picture of that whale with the same whale, but where you can see the dorsal fin and the blowhole, because from the dots you know how wide the dorsal fin is, you can then also work out the dorsal fin to blowhole length. And if you've got that, you've got a really good measurement of how big that killer whale is, therefore how old it is, and possibly also what sex it is. So you can build up a whole lot of information about the pod from simply um, getting that one measurement. And again, that was a platform that we offered these scientists to move on from. And the behavior that we were after, which I'll finally get to, was it was really amazing when we saw it. As I say, this was like a holy grail for me. I'd heard about this 32 years, 32 years and 10 days it took between hearing about it and seeing it. And when we saw it, we didn't just see it once. I think over the course of the two weeks that we spent filming it, we saw 25 attacks and about 160 waves being made by the seals. And we would follow them, not the seals, the orcas. We follow the orcas for a while, and then it was like you turned on a switch. They would decide, okay, guys, we're going hunting. And they would head off into the pack ice, and they would be looking for, for um, seals sitting on top of those ice floes. And the amazing thing as well was there was potentially five different kinds of seals on top of those ice floes. They were only after one, and they could pop their head up, and if it was the wrong one, they just swim on. And they were only interested in Weddell seals. And all these, these guys, that's a wed, and that one's, he knows it's a wed, and he's you know, pretty much toast. He's having a closer look at this point. And the Weddell seal, some of these Weddell seals would, be, would sleep. They, would, they wouldn't really know what was happening, and they would go quite deeply asleep. The killer whales would be popping up, looking, blowing, etc., etc. But when you see one killer whale there like that, when you see two or like that, you pretty much knew that that Weddell seal's toast. Once they saw them, recognised that we, we never saw a Weddell seal escape, um, and we never saw any other kinds of seals actually harassed. And when they'd seen a, whale, a seal like this, then the pod would come together, they would seem to have some kind of discussion, and then two or three of them, or three or four of them rather, would, would go off to one side, they would, they would push the ice flow into open water, then three or four of them would swim off to one side, turn around, lie on their sides and swim in together, 
line abreast, tails beating in unison. And by doing that, they would create a, a wave, generate a wave big enough to wash the seal off the ice floe. And um, that was how it happened. And then we further refined the technique by we had a, a remote camera, a little camera on the end of a pole. And, and John and Bob, again, were really good. They said, look, when these seals start hunting, you'll be able to get so close that they will not be bothered. Because I was very sensitive about you know, upsetting the seal. I didn't want to upsetting the orcas. When you get in a predation situation, the key thing, I think, is not to influence the outcome one way or the other. Sometimes the predator will win, sometimes the prey will escape. What I want to do is just stand back observe it, get all the shots, but not tip the scales one way or the other. So I really didn't want to take the inflatable in the middle of it. But John said, look, once they get in hunting mode, we've seen them do similar things, you know, hunting in different ways. Believe me, you can get right in amongst them. And sure enough, when, when we did get in the Zodiac and when Doug dropped the pole over the side, the orcas were really, they just carried on just the same. The main thing that limited the pole cam shots were that sometimes the visibility would be much better underwater than in other places. Sometimes we'd go out hoping to get some shots, but it would be very murky and smeary underwater. And so um, this is the sequence that we got. Um, that's all I have to say, really. We were going to open it up for um, discussion. It was very interesting. Oh, sorry. Dan, you got something else? Uh, yeah, I was going to oh. a little bit more to talk about. Come on, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Come in, Dan. That's right. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Follow that, as they say. Um, I just wanted to uh, quickly talk a little bit about um, the final program in the series, uh, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. Uh, so we should have plenty of time for that, I hope. Um, I said earlier how the initial commission for Frozen was for six programs. Uh, my first job when I came on board was to try and get a seventh program commissioned about the effects of um, climate change at the polls, uh, which uh, we successfully managed to pull in the funding for from BBC One, Discovery Channel, same, same uh, people broadly as had funded the rest of the series, uh, largely because we promised them the same level of drama and action and the same production values as the rest of the series. Uh, we got less money, uh, but we'd always knew throughout that we'd be able to piggyback off the rest of the series, the, their, their shoots and also the fantastic footage uh, they were getting. Uh, so we were optimistic we could do it. Um, it didn't take long, though, before we realised that uh, it was going to be a tough sell, as they say, on, on BBC One. Uh, we wanted to talk about some quite complex science uh, and you know, string that together into a narrative that was going to be you know, challenging for people to, to stay with. And we were concerned that we couldn't do it without, you know, ideally, we'd need a, a guide, a really good presenter to do it. Um, we thought we couldn't possibly ask David Attenborough, he was 82. I mean, what 82-year-old would go to the North Pole and the South Pole? It would be absolutely insane. So, of course, <laughs> um, he was keen as mustard. Uh, and we couldn't really hold him back, to be honest. And um, it, when we were just absolutely, obviously absolutely stoked at that point because um, we just knew that that was... Um, going to give us a so much better product. So, um, but we still needed, still knew, uh, we still had a lot of challenges in making it, uh, not least uh, that we still need, we wanted a, a big opening to the program. Uh, so, uh, you know, something that would really get bums on seats and get people hooked in to watch it, because the big concern was going to be that people are going to think, well, climate change, I've heard all about that, I know what's happening, you know, do I really want to stick with this, I like the rest of the series and so on, but maybe this isn't for me. So we wanted uh, something big, something spectacular. I'd heard about uh, some very dramatic predictions that was about the, uh, the state of the sea ice uh, in the Arctic Ocean, particularly what's happening at the North Pole. So we thought, well, you know, maybe we should go for it. Uh, and we approached a Russian tour operator that does uh, very fancy trips for wealthy Russians. Uh, up to the North Pole in the depths of winter, and up we flew. That's an Antonov plane, modified with the engines on the top, so you can land. This is uh, the frozen ocean about 70 miles away from the North Pole. Uh, as a camp where everybody stayed, uh, and from there it was a brief helicopter ride. Again, the Cineflex, one of the most widely travelled Cineflex in the world. 
uh, the, that's the aerial camera attached to the side of the helicopter there, uh, which then flew on up to the North Pole. Uh, it was a massive operation and expensive, as I'll talk about, but uh, I think it gave us the kind of attention-grabbing opening that we wanted. So, we wanted a big, bangy opening, and I think, you know, hopefully, we got it. Um, but uh, well, this was uh, just one of just two trips uh, that we could afford to do with, with David. It's so expensive to work in the poles. Uh, that was expensive. And then uh, on, on the continuation of this trip, this is the only Arctic trip we did. We then carried on. We went down to Svalbard, and we, uh, we filmed David with a crew of uh, Norwegian scientists uh, darting... Uh, polar bears, to, for their, which, which they do every year, so we wanted to get him out there to talk about the effects uh, of uh, climate change on polar bears. Uh, again, fantastic sequence, we were very happy with it, but all this Arctic shooting blew about two-thirds of our entire shooting budget. Uh, as I said, we had, a, we had less money, so um, we were pretty strapped for cash by the time we even thought about uh, Antarctica. Uh, Doug had a much nicer picture than I did, but anyway. Uh, um, which, of course, is considerably more remote than the Arctic, and you know, on the face of it, should be a whole lot more expensive. There's, but there's no, there's no scheduled flights. There's no roads. It's an incredibly long way away from anywhere. The only way, uh, and this was uh, actually a, a big problem, of course, across the entire series. There was an awful lot we wanted to shoot in Antarctica, but it's incredibly difficult to get to, and incredibly uh, logistically complex. So, um, and this that's an opportunity really to talk about a little bit, and we're sort of running on time, but. Uh, Partnerships uh, were incredibly important across this whole series. Uh, up in the Arctic, we got an awful lot of help from Canadian Polar Continental Shelf Projects. The Norwegian Polar Institute helped us out a great deal. And in the Antarctic, British Antarctic Survey helped us a lot. Uh, but also we got uh, phenomenal level of support from the US National Science Foundation, without which, really, that the series would have been completely impossible. Uh, the Americans operate in uh, the Ross Sea, which is this sort of bite out of the continent at the, in the, at the bottom here of this slide. That's the place we knew we were going to be able to see emperor penguin colonies, huge ones of those, huge daily penguin colonies as well, uh, the famous spy-hopping orcas that we're all so fond of, uh, and uh, also be able to get into the South Pole and to, to Captain Scott's hut, all out of that one area. We knew we needed to get there, but uh, we had to persuade the Americans to take us in. Uh, the National Science Foundation operates a, a scheme called the Artists and Writers Programme, which a lot of people have gone in with previously. We went to them, and they said, no way, you're far too big. You know, they looked at the scale of our, what we wanted and just said, sorry, we can't support that. Uh, so instead, we had to go to a different programme called the uh, uh, Informal Science Education uh, Programme. That, that is the guidelines they gave me for writing the, the application. You can read it if you want at the end, but I really don't recommend it. Um, it it's incredibly tedious. Uh, two months it took us to write the document to, uh, to, to apply to go in. Uh, we, had to, we, would, we had to detail everything down to the, de the last dehydrated meal, how many nights per person in a sleeping bag and when, the number of litres of kerosene, exactly when every cameraman, we had eight cameramen went out there in total over about five months and about nine production staff, everybody coming in at different times. We had to detail all of this in absolute you know, forensic detail um, before we could, they'd even look at us. But we also had to, to demonstrate the, the educational value of the series, uh, for which, fortunately, we were able to call on planet Earth uh, and some of the data, the, uh, the data we had from there, which showed that uh, in, in the States, which, of course... NSF was only really interested in, in the educational value in the, in the US, the American government program. Planet Earth had had amazing success amongst underserved audiences or audiences who, who typically uh, don't watch science programming when they're in the States. Much more female audience, a lot of more urban, more ethnic minorities who are tending not to be reached by this science programming otherwise. So it ticked an awful lot of boxes for them. And we said, well, look, we think Frozen will do the same. And that, I think, is what swung it for us. We've had to commit to do a... To do a a big survey that's funded by National Science Foundation to see how effective the, program, the, the series actually is um, in educating the audiences. Um, but that's a small price to pay for the, the logistical support, which really probably adds up to millions of pounds worth of, of, of effort. And that's just way beyond anything we could ever have afforded. So it was well worth the effort. Um, this is so October 2009. Our first flights went in. Uh, flying down in a, one of these, one of these great big, um, I 
can't remember what the name of the plane is, C-17. C-17. C-17, these huge uh, US Air Force planes that fly down. Again, this is the frozen sea in Antarctica, land there. Uh, and this is near McMurdo Base, which is where the, uh, most of the US effort is based. Health and safety, they take, again, very seriously. You have to do three days of training, to, uh, for survival training out on the ice. They don't take it 100% seriously. You know. <laughs> uh, there's the odd light moment. This is the famous bucket head. I don't know if you know what this is. You have to put these buckets on your head, and then um, that is to simulate being in a whiteout. Uh, and then if you leave, you know, the, the take-home message from this is don't go out to the loo in the middle of a whiteout. You know, pee, pee in a bottle, with a bucket pee in your pants. Is. <laughs> don't, don't go out in a whiteout. Yeah, that's what you can take away from this. Uh, surprisingly, not everybody had to go through this training. You know, when uh, Sadi rocked up, they didn't make him put a bucket on his head. I'll tell you that. Um, he was only allowed in for about 12 days. I say only allowed in. He, he, we could only uh, get in there for about 12 days. Um, so it, it, we were totally reliant on helicopter and plane support to get around, uh, which is uh, incredibly useful to us. We did have a great deal of guilt about the amount of helicopter flights, considering we're making a program about climate change. Um, we had to balance that with what we hope is the value, educationally, uh, towards, towards, um, you know, towards raising awareness. Um, as I say, I think we'll probably move on to questions now, but that's a pretty good place to finish. Um, the, and I think what it really does is it kind of sums up what we tried to do Program 7, make use of the beautiful footage that have been shot by the rest of the series uh, and design our pieces to camera with David around the knowledge that we had that to play with. And that's what enabled us on a tighter budget to, to create the kind of gloss, the sort of landmark feel we wanted the program to have. Uh, and also, uh, that also illustrates you know, the use of uh, how important it was to, to partner up with these other organisations and the support they gave us. And above all, I think if there was one message we'd all like to finish with, Doug, Doug was talking about it earlier, but um, it was the value of working with scientists. You know, all that information comes from them. All the access to the animals is, is through them and, and monitored by them. Uh, and without them, we couldn't have done any of this. So uh, for all our expertise, it's the scientists uh, giving their time. They're the unsung heroes, really, behind Frozen Planet. So that's the message. I think we'd all give at the end of it. But anyway, that's enough of us talking. I thought maybe you guys might have some questions to ask. Go ahead. Hold on. Sorry, we'll There's give a you a microphone. microphone yeah, yeah. This is almost like a question that would come at the end of the questions, really, but I think I need to go, so I'm really sorry about that. really enjoyed the, the presentation and everything. I'm sorry it was so interrupted by people leaving as well. Um, I wanted to ask um, if, if there was ever a discussion about going into sort of like the interior of the land-based Antarctic. I know there won't be that many creatures there, but does any, did anyone? Was that ever part of the discussion? Did you, how close to that did you get? We, we did go there, actually, one of the clips that I've run out of time for um, features that, actually. We went to the South Pole, um, took David there. Uh, he closed Programme 1 there. Um, we did a piece from Programme program 7 there uh, not, uh, as well, which we didn't use, but we also took him onto the ice cap for, for Programme 7. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was... And the dry, dry, dry valleys, the dry valleys and, and, and uh, Mount Erebus yeah. and so on as well. Oh, OK, great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. It is difficult when the largest totally terrestrial animal in the Antarctic is a wingless midge, about yeah. four millimetres long. It's kind of tricky to compete with the killer whales. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Thank you. They're all stunned. Uh, gentleman at the back. Hi. Uh, you know when you have the time-lapse shots and you have the ice growing, how do you make that really satisfying sound where it kind of <laughs> crackles slowly? How well, do you the, do that? Obviously, this, the sound isn't recorded at the time um, in the sense that it is, it is playing with time. So you, you, can't, you can't sort of record a split second every 25 frames or whatever. Um, a lot of the sound recording is actually done separately. So, so all the teams going out into the field take um, appropriate kits, so hydrophones and things like that, so that we've got a sort of um, suite of sounds for the track layers to use afterwards. So, so the, I'm not sure exactly where that particular 
sound comes from, but it's all, it's all sort of naturalised scapes. They're not necessarily captured at the same time as time lapse. But it's also, to be honest, some of the underwater stuff, when, when ice moves next to each other, um, it makes a, a sort of creaking, groaning sound. It's almost like it's squeezing two bits of polystyrene together, that kind of squeaky, creaky sound. And um, there's obviously no sound underneath the ice, and so to some extent you use artistic licence to to put a sound over it, which... There, there, yeah, there is. I mean, there's that sounds of Weddell seals and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's, yeah. to some extent, you're playing with time, so you sort of, you, you play with a soundscape that, that mirrors what you would what you would get. Yeah. There's a three-week track play on each of these yeah. shows after, after they're picture locked. There's a lady over here, please. Yeah. Can someone get the mic back? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, that was lovely. Thanks very much. I was interested, you were talking about possibly being a bit of a tougher sell for BBC One. Mm. Is there ever a tension when you're deciding on the direction of the programme about the quality of information you can give the scientific information versus the kind of spectacle that we're going to get when it comes to pleasing your editors or whatever? There's always a trade-off, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and also a trade-off with co-producers co uh, around that. Discovery Channel tend to ask us to put in, shove in more facts all the time. They're very sort of fact and information driven. Uh, taste, certainly as programme makers, and I, I think probably, you know, nationally perhaps is, you know, sparser information and let, let the film breathe a little bit more so that people can sort of take it in and have a chance to absorb that information. But, I mean, for, for my money, you can... I think an awful lot of these shows, you know, would work on BBC Two, BBC One. A lot of the BBC Two natural history we do would work equally well on BBC One. The, I think the climate change one was a slightly different kind of um, beast, really. Uh, and there it was, quite a challenge to to write it. <laughs> we were just running back and forth all the time, trying to get the facts exactly right but also get them into a, into a flow that would work and make them an engaging sort of story uh, and a very simplified story. But that's one of the advantages is, is a multi-platform. You know, you can have your programme and then you can have your red dot, so you can, have, you can go into different levels of it depending on what you want. You can link into websites. And these days the Beeb is into, you know, with these big series, producing as much background information if the viewer chooses to go into it as you could, and there's even talk about, you know, doing two soundtracks. You know, we get so many complaints about the music. That <laughs> there was one idea, OK, let's, let's do a version where, at the viewer's discretion, they can take the music off and just leave the natural sound effects in the commentary. So all these things are possible. Like, I thought it was a nice balance, though, for with natural history. I feel as if there's a lack of information, but it seemed to be pulled off there, so thank you. Yeah. Good, well, thanks. So lady in the middle at the back, please. Oh, sorry. Oh. Hi. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm a very lowly student filmmaker, and this is the only place that I get to go to today because I'm so poor. So if you could give me one piece of advice that I'm looking forward to making this stuff for the rest of my life, if you could give me one bit of advice, what would you give me? Do you want to start? Yeah? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, seriously, if you are starting, I mean, I, I, I get emails from people in your position, not infrequently, and I've got information that I can give you, I'm happy to give you by email. If I had one piece of advice to give to you is um, you just have to be passionate. You have to be really want to do whatever branch of the industry you want to do. Hang on in there. The, getting started is the hardest bit, really. But being at festivals like this is a good start because networking or, or just getting to know, you know people and what they do and, and try to make films about what you try to get involved with films that you believe in, and try to make try to make films. You know, keep making films as much as you can. It's, yeah, I totally agree. That's about getting your foot in the door, really, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. Once you're in there, once you know, people want to work with people they know and people they trust, then that's always the hump to get over, isn't it? Yeah. But stick at it. Keep writing lots of letters. Keep meeting lots of people. Don't be. A, I hesitate to say this, but don't be afraid to, you know, keep pestering people <laughs> to some degree. <laughs> You know, not excessively, but don't stalk them. But um, <laughs> stalk them yeah, I think uh, 
you know, I, I never mind if somebody's written to me and they write to me sort of three months later, just a quick hello, you know. I don't mind, you know. If I've got nothing, I'll say I don't have anything, but every now and then, you know. You, you tend to, re I personally, I tend to respond to whatever the last thing I saw was. So if I think, oh, we need a field assistant, I think, oh, somebody wrote to me last week. Exactly. I go back, I go back to that, that one, yeah. and not, not the one I got two months ago, so, yeah. Keep, so, thanks very much. Yeah, keep pushing. But, uh, find me afterwards. I'll give you my email address. <laughs> Hi. Um, great film, by the way. Um, a lot of the characters, the animals in the films, have amazing personalities. And what I'm curious to know is how much of this is pure luck, how much of it is um, a careful vetting process, and how much is um, clever narrative to bring out these characters. Yeah, I mean, from the beginning, we, we had sort of animal characters we, we wanted to, to follow, um, but there was no guarantee we could actually go back to the same polar bear or the same whatever. So you have to be, you have to be a little bit careful to not mislead the viewers and say, this is the same bear, you know, whatever, in the next programme. Um, but a lot of the trials that each animal faces are repeated throughout the population. Um, some of the, I mean, the, the criminal penguin sequence is one that a lot of people... Uh, touch upon where the males are stealing stones from each other. Um, and that was a very fortunate piece of behaviour picked up because the cameraman spent four months in a colony. So, and I think that's the thing. If you're spending large amounts of time filming with a particular animal or a particular group of animals, with the killer whales, it was the same pod of killer whales a day on, day after day, you get to really understand their behaviour. Um, and you, you know those little kind of idiosyncrasies. And, and then it doesn't take much in the script to just set it up with, you know, this guy, he's going to you know, turn to stealing stones. And then suddenly, everybody can just see... I mean, animals are actually very, very expressive. Um, so everyone can just see through their behaviour what they're doing. Um, and, um, and I think feel that sort of familiarity. You know, we're all pet owners, and, you know, just place the seed of what the animal is going to do, and then let the behaviour speak for itself, really. I think a lot of it also comes from real depth of understanding. Mm. You know, most of the people on the team are, are zoologists, mm. and you know, so read a lot about this stuff. And, and I think once you understand in depth what's motivating an animal and, and the sort of situation it's in, the, the, the kind of dilemma, without anthropomorphizing too much, the sort of dilemmas it faces, the choices mm. it faces, and the, and the potential perils, then I think that's when the, the character starts to sort of come mm. out of that. Yeah, you can pick an yeah. animal character, same way as you would with a human, say, right, we're going to tell this penguin story. And that's a really clever way of, of deciding how to tell your sequence. And, and a lot of that is done before you even go out to the field. You know, you know what behaviours you're hoping to get. And then when it starts to happen, you say, right, this is that penguin story. And that sort of helps direct your, your shots. Hi, um, first of all, I think what you've created is absolutely phenomenal, so I really congratulate you on, the, on that. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how much it cost. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think the final figures are in yet. Um, when, well. yeah, when, I don't think we're allowed to talk about exactly what it costs because it's yeah. a combination of producers, co-producers. So we see it's discovery and channels, investment and all that. So at the bottom line is we're not allowed to, but it broadly works out as about a third of the cost comes from the licence fee about a third comes from Discovery Channel, who are our main co-funders. And, um, and then a third comes from BBC Worldwide selling it to, I think, about 120 countries or something like that. I mean, it's an amazing number of countries that have already shown it. Um, yeah, I mean, the newspaper reports quoted, yeah, 100 million, blah, and we wish we'd had 100 million. <laughs> um, I, th I think the thing that's amazing is when you are the BBC Natural History Unit, you've got that reputation, you can go to somebody like the National Science Foundation. I mean, the, the resources we had in Antarctica, we could never have... You, if you put a cost on that, you'd never, you'd never manage to do it. You know, you'd be talking feature film budgets, and we were on a television budget, which is very different. Um, but I think we, we do get... You get remarkable access to things um, by joining scientific teams and, and sort of... Um, because you're doing something that is educational, then, then it brings the cost right down compared with what you would, you would pay if you were doing it commercially. Oh. Okay. Hi, I just um, wanted to um, say thank you very much. A really beautiful program and a really interesting talk. Um, and the question was, um, when the, the scene with the tripods that were fixed to the seabed and, and to the sea ice, I was just wondering how you kind of ensure that that doesn't damage any life, because especially when the sponges and corals and everything are growing at such a slow rate, are there any, there must be like microscopic 
um, bits of life that could be damaged? And is there a, a sort of really lengthy process with the scientific well, preparation for that and things? A lot of the sea ice, a lot of the, the ground down there is bare gravel because, um, and you would choose to put your tripod legs in areas that don't have anything encrusting. Because bear in mind that every year, periodically, these big icebergs come in and they'll get driven in shore to whatever depth they, they stretch down to and they go up and down with the tide. So these sponges and all these things are, are subject to quite a lot of ice scour anyway. They're being damaged by the ice. Um, in certain areas. But, right. um, so when you go down there and choose to put your tripod somewhere, then you would pick a bit just like on a gravelly beach where there was nothing living. So it's quite easy to find bits that are Yeah, just... yeah, it's not difficult oh, okay. to find areas like that. And then, you know, you obviously wouldn't put one on, on any form of yeah. life that was down there. Yeah. And then the tripods upside down on the ice are, are held up there either by ratchet straps or you make them buoyant. So you tie a big buoyancy bag to the tripod and effectively give it gravity working the other way and, and you plant their plant their legs against the sea ice are there any like colonies of um, um, you know krill and things under the sea ice that could be that you could well the krill is a pelagic organism anyway so they're always darting around underneath the ice yeah. so usually by the time you get the tripod set up the tripod of, uh, they've gone the krill have headed off somewhere yeah. else yeah. okay yeah. thank you hi um Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the show. I really enjoyed the talk as well. Um, I was wondering, like, what are your backgrounds? Like, Liz, you mentioned uh, you started diving. I was just wondering uh, how you got into, like, your position now. Could you start with? Um, well, I started off with that. My first passion was diving, and then I be, did, went to university, did a marine biology degree. Then I worked as a scientific diver in the Antarctic, went there in 1976. Um, did several expeditions down there, met a film crew, and uh, was doing a lot of stills photography at that time. But having worked with them for a week, I thought the movie is the place to be, so I just moved into movie. Um, I've never had a formal lesson in photography in my life. Probably shows at times. <laughs> so that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, well, I started off yeah, uh, in conservation. I did, did zoology as a student and then started off as a conservationist, uh, as a conservation biologist. And then uh, a friend of mine started working in the natural history unit. I'd always been interested in writing. I hadn't really thought about filmmaking, but it just struck me as, as a good way to kind of um, spread the word about conservation and um, encourage people to care about the natural world. So I got into it like that and like Doug, I then sort of picked up the skills on, on the job. Mm. Mostly I've done, done it beyond the old course. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I was, a, I was a biologist before, so zoology degree, um, worked a bit at the BBC after that, because I happened to be at Bristol, and then stayed on and actually did a PhD, and um, I worked on a mixture of cameras, and I worked on colour vision in fish, so it was using technical cameras and kit to be able to kind of work out what they're seeing and how they use it in their behaviour, so it kind of brought filming and animals together, um, and then I sort of sidelined into more television and and using visuals to tell stories rather than um, science. It's really nice you hit a, a much bigger audience if you make something like this than you do if you write scientific papers, and I think that's the draw to a lot of people. But most of the natural history unit are biologists by background. Yeah, so. but not all, so don't, no, don't be deterred. not all, but... You know. There's been lots of uh, many wonderful series over the last 20-odd years. Uh, I was wondering what's next. There is anything, any big... Uh, any pl major plans for any new series or what's not being covered? <laughs> <laughs> if, you have, if you have any ideas, please. <laughs> write them down. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, the natural history unit is about, I mean, it's about 180, 180 mm, people work in the unit in Bristol and I think it's about 200 hours of programming a year comes out of the unit. So the next, next big one uh, for BBC One is a series called Africa that will be out early next year. Um, Dan's been working on a series about Arabia, um, was Arabia. Um, and then we're just in the process of looking at 2016, 2017. There's a constant, there's a development team who are constantly looking for new ideas and talking to the commissioners and so on. So it's, it's like this juggernaut, it just keeps going and new ideas keep coming in. But one of the challenges is absolutely we tend to have, we've covered an awful lot of the world. So a lot of the challenge now is looking for new ways of telling stories about animals or places that you might be familiar with. Um, it's perhaps, perhaps the next big thing will come out of different narratives or different technologies? 
Yeah, it is difficult. You set yourself a high bar and then the next time you come along, they want that bar to be exceeded. And um, that was what was what was really satisfying about the Orca um, wave washing sequence was it's not, it's pretty unusual to get a completely new piece of behaviour involving a big, well, involving two big charismatic megafauna, as we call them, um, that you don't come across them very often. And, and to get it for Frozen Planet was really quite something. And I also was thinking about the characters. Um, the idea originally was, was to involve, Alistair this idea of involving Albatross and, and the Daily Penguins as being leading characters, but the Albatross didn't really carry it because it's interesting, when you talk about birds, birds are a hard sell, especially to the Americans. They just glaze over when you mention birds. But penguins are sort of honorary humans because they look like we people. So you can sell penguins, despite them being birds, the Americans don't look on them as birds. They are we human people running around. So I'm quite keen on penguins. So the albatross fell by the wayside. And as more and more good material began to come in from killer whales, they got to be a much bigger part of the story. And, and they became something that you know, could come in several times in different episodes, etc. So that's the way the series evolves organically as well, but also responds to the strengths um, that you're getting as you actually film it. One more question in the middle there. Uh, when you're filming um, under the ice and you had to drill those holes down to have a look, and you said you already had a storyboard of what you wanted to film and stuff, did you spend an awful lot of time before um, drilling sort of little holes to just see what was underneath and find where you wanted to drill your big holes to go? Oh, down? a lot. A lot of the locations are places that are, are sort of known already. Um, so, say in Antarctica for the um, where the Brinacle was filmed and so on, um, Doug had been down there for life a few years before with Hugh Miller, who was also on that shoot. So they knew, you know, there were locations that are known that you've got a nice rock or you've got a nice particular ice formation and so on. So a lot of it is talking to people who've dived there. I mean, the first year of, of setting up a series like this is just talking to everybody who's been there, who's done it before and so on, and trying to work out those things in advance. And then it is a quite an organic process. You know what, you know what story you want to tell and you, you storyboard it, but you also have to be a bit flexible when you're there and sort of say say in Russia, you know, I would, I would get in on the first dive, we'd look at the location, then come back out, and then we'd, we'd storyboard it from there based on what actual ingredients we had once we were actually under the water. So it's, um, yeah, it's about having an idea, but then being flexible around that when you know what you're actually dealing with. Yeah, the guy who works in the Antarctic at McMurdo, who helped me a lot in life, now I went to the Antarctic in 76, Rob Robbins, who's the diving officer at McMurdo, he has been diving officer at McMurdo every summer for the last 31 years. So you would say to Rob, I need this shot. And he would say, oh, I know just where to go and drill the hole to get that. And you would put the hole in and go down underneath. And sure enough, there was just what you wanted. One in the middle. Hiya. Um, I went to a talk by the colorist for the series and he was talking about how he added a lot of like oranges to shots to sort of make it seem like it was the end of the day when really there wasn't like day and night as much because of the seasons and stuff. How much of that um, was thought about prior to the coloring like where before even shooting like how much how much did you think about the coloring really when going to shoot them? Um, I guess probably the areas he's talking about, those sorts of shots would probably be things where narratively you sort of think you'd need to bridge between different sequences and you can have quite a jarring sort of jump, so he'll, he'll adjust it. I mean, within the yeah. settings of the camera, we gave ourselves as much latitude as, as we could uh, in advance with, you know, with the knowledge we were going to have, have, as I said before, you know, high dynamic range and everything um, to cope with. Um, it might, if, it would depend, it's sort of horses for courses really. Some of the sequences, you would, it would have been quite tightly storyboarded and you'd know you were shooting a shot that you know, might need to go later on in the sequence, so you might need to grade it, grade it down to help mm -hmm. tell the story. That, that, could, that could happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other, other times it would just be, well, we need you know, ad hoc, we need something to, to, to fill that gap. So you, I mean, you have to be quite careful what you select because, you know, Although it's 24-hour light, the sun does dip towards the horizon, so your shadow is completely changed. So you can't take a shot at midday 
bright, stark white ice and dark shadows and grade that for night or anything. It has to be, you do have to work within the natural bounds of what, um, you know, what the sun is doing. But also, it's the old story of, of you know, we, sometimes we will film an entire sequence in one event, but often we need to see that event several times to get different angles on it, to, to, to shoot some of it slow motion, some of it real time, etc. So when you finally come to put the sequence together, you may be having to grade very different um, you know, shots that were taken under different conditions um, and, and grade them together so that they, they don't jar one shot to the next. And that's the sort of thing that he might have been referring to. I think, yeah, I think we need to wrap up there. Sorry. I think there are people no more questions. I think we're way over time. Thank you.